everyone. Welcome to Alumni Talks. Um, we're really excited to um, have you all with us tonight. want to thank students for um, being here with us this evening. We've got some really wonderful alums um, to introduce to you for this evening's Alumni Talks. My name is Amy France. I'm a 2001 alum um, and I serve Gordon as the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement. Um, I'm strategically located um, with my colleagues in the CCI suite um, to continue to build um, better and closer relationships between our current students and our alums. Um, so I'm really excited about this series of alumni talks. Um, and I'd love to um, have our panelists um, turn on their videos um, and unmute themselves so that I can introduce them this evening. Great, thanks everyone. Um, this evening, we've got four wonderful alums with us. Um, we have Lindsay Alexander, um, who's a 2009 alum, and she is a senior manager um, of global intelligence at the company we work currently. Um, we have Marcus Marini, who's a 2018 alum. He's a global trade licensing analysis with um, Raytheon Missiles and Defense. Um, Brendan Sweeney is a 2017 alum who's an assistant director of federal funds um, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we have um, Christopher Hollinger, who's a 91 alum, um, formerly in the Air Force and is now an associate um, with Go Lightly, Mulligan and Morgan. So thanks everyone for joining me this evening. Great. Um, so what we hope to do tonight, I actually have a number of questions to, to get us started, um, but we also will look forward to um, taking any questions that our um, students that are tuning in may have um, to join us. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, Chris, I'm wondering, would you start us off? Would you mind introducing yourself a little bit more? Um, tell me a little bit more about your background and then what you do now. Sure, happy to, Amy, thanks. Uh, give me a wave if everybody's hearing me okay. So um, like Amy said, I graduated in 91. Uh, I did participated in the Air Force ROTC program at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell while I was a student there at Gordon. Uh, got commissioned on the day I, got, uh, the day I graduated and uh, went on active duty in 1992, January of 1992. I spent 23 years in the Air Force as an air battle manager. Uh, which means I was a mission crew guy on AWACS and Joint Stars. Uh, I also had an opportunity to do a lot of other interesting things in the context of that. Um, I got to do some staff tours in a couple of really interesting places. I served as a joint staff officer at European Command Headquarters. Uh, and in that context, got to work for uh, two different four-star generals working a lot of uh, national security policy, policy pol political military policy issues. Um, when you work with senior leaders, you get to, to do a lot of interesting stuff that touches more on the more on the national strategic level than the than the tactical level. Um, coming out of that job, in addition to doing some other joint things, um, uh, meaning that I worked with multi-service organizations, I worked with members of all the different branches of the military um, in staff capacities. I also, uh, you know, as a standard kind of tactical operation stuff does, I I flew combat in Afghanistan uh, for a couple of months. I did some combat work in the, in Iraq at the beginning of the Iraq War. Uh, not in Iraq, but sorry, managing the air campaign for the Iraq war in early 2003, um, and then flew some combat over there as well. Uh, later in my career, I served as an air liaison officer with the 1st Armored Division, so I was on the ground in Baghdad for six months in 2010, uh, which was during the transition from Operation Iraqi Freedom to Operation New Dawn. So again, saw a lot of transitional things happening in Iraq, spent a lot of time talking with leaders uh, on kind of the the hinge points of, of what we were doing in Iraq at that point. Um, when I got done with that, I had the, the, the neat opportunity at the end of my career to teach uh, at the Joint Forces Staff College here in Norfolk, Virginia. I live in Virginia Beach and I was working in Norfolk. And in that capacity, I was teaching mid-career officers joint operational planning, uh, national palm mill strategy and national security strategy stuff. So uh, again, towards the end of my career, I got to spend a lot of time thinking and writing and talking and teaching about uh, national security policy and strategy um, and those kind of national strategic level things. Um, so that was the <clears throat> kind of the interesting delving into policy that I did at the end of my military career. 
um, and, and using some of the experience that I had in the middle part of my career, um, which was really just a blessing and, a, and a, you know, a fortunate thing. I didn't necessarily set out and strive to do that in my career. As a, I was an aviator, that was my primary uh, uh, function in the military, but the staff jobs that I did, uh, I got the opportunity to do some of that unique stuff that the typical Air Force staff guy doesn't get to do. Um, and it kind of fit my personality because I've always been an academic geek and a policy geek and that kind of thing. Um, so I loved working around in DC. And, and one of the things that I did uh, when I was at UConn was I helped manage the, uh, my, my senior leaders DC engagement. So I was always on his prep team for his meetings with congressional leaders, with senior DOD officials, um, so I, I had the, again, the, the fortune of being able to kind of run around and interact with a lot of the, um, military legislative aides, um, for some senior members of Congress, um, Senator Inhofe, uh, was one, uh, did a lot of stuff in the state department as well. A couple of assistant secretary level state department engagements and things like that. So, um, helping advise senior leaders in that capacity. So that's kind of the most, uh, public policy stuff that I did in my time in the military beyond just you know, loving my career as an Air Force officer and doing my best to integrate with my faith and my integrate my faith with my profession in the military, trying to be the best Christian officer that I could be, um, which was a big part of what Gordon did for me and kind of prepping me for moving into that space. Um, when I retired in 2014, uh, I prayed about it a lot and took a kind of a, a, a big pivot in my career. Went to law school here at Regent University uh, in Virginia Beach, got my law degree, and now I'm, uh, I'm an attorney. I clerked on the Court of Appeals in Virginia for a couple of years, uh, worked in big law for a year at Troutman Pepper, here in Virginia, in their Virginia Beach office. And uh, just a couple of months ago, oh, well, just about two months ago, I left Troutman, uh, picked up the position that I'm in now as an associate uh, in a small local firm, very small, uh, five lawyers, a couple of paralegals. Uh, and I do uh, much more local Virginia law, uh, both general uh, civil litigation and primarily appeals. That, that's my passion as appellate work. So I'm working to build an appellate practice um, in, the, in the Virginia Court of Appeals and the Virginia Supreme Court. Thank you so much. Chris. That's really wonderful to to hear kind of your whole background and um, thank you for your service as well. We're just really appreciative of that and so proud to have a Gordon alum who has served our country in, in this way. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, Lindsay, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of giving a bit more about your background. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I am Lindsay. Um, I also have an echo, so I apologize if you guys can hear that. Um, I uh, graduated Gordon in 2009 as a history and international affairs major. Um, after Gordon, I went on at the FBI. Um, I worked in serving white collar crime uh, squad as well as on the Joint Commission Task Force for a few years. Um, after that, I actually was recruited into the CIA and was um, undercover for about a decade um, working in war zones, working in East Europe, um, in other parts of the New York Pond. And um, got a lot of great experience there with working with international partners, working on various types of operations, um, meeting with increasing level individuals. Um, and then after that, I actually made a decision to go into the private sector and um, found myself um, first at Barclays, setting up their financial intelligence unit, and then um, now at WeWork, um, working on their, um, like building up their intelligence program and uh, focusing on mitigating uh, threats and identifying threats that affect the business, which to my surprise is very similar to what I did in the government. And um, a huge part of that, um, for those that might not be aware of like the corporate security um, structure, the intelligence component looks at um, like threats that Im impact um, the brand risk and the employees and those that use like the product or our space. And so right now we're actually dealing with like a lot of disinformation actors in our spaces, um, dealing with uh, human trafficking rings and looking at those. And I'm um, just seeing, you know, how people are using our spaces for criminal enterprises, which isn't the greatest thing, but it's still kind of giving back in a way as well. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Appreciate all the work that, that you have done as well. Um, Brendan, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit about your background. Sure thing. Thanks, Amy. Um, my name is Brendan Sweeney. 
I currently work as the assistant director for federal funds um, in the state's executive office for administration and finance, uh, which essentially is the governor's budget office. Um, and so in that role, I focus uh, primarily on state and local government policy. Um, as of right now, I recently just stepped into this job. Uh, the position came about entirely because of the pandemic. So my work is focused on leading the state's COVID-19 response uh, for all the cities and towns in the Commonwealth um, and managing the $500 million program we have to try to help these guys with some of the PPE expenses and the other things that the municipalities have had to incur in order to essentially keep services running and make sure that their residents are safe in the midst of the pandemic. It's definitely definitely been a challenging time. Uh, but before that, I was a budget analyst in the same office. So I've been with the state for about two years. And um, I actually got my start right out of Gordon in local government, uh, which was an interesting opportunity. Uh, surprisingly, you know, local government gets the rap as kind of being the boring of the, the most boring of the three levels of government. But it was actually very entertaining. Uh, it was a good opportunity for me right out of school. And I was a double major in political science and business administration. Uh, so that's what then through a few internships at the state house, as well as in local government, I actually interned for a law firm initially too, and decided that was not the path for me. Um, but through those experiences, I ended up in local government and then was able to work my way up to the position at the state that I hold today. That's great. Thanks so much, Brendan. Um, Marcus, love to hear a little bit more from you. Absolutely, thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcus Marini. I'm from Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, while at Gordon, I was an economics and political science double major. Fun fact, Brendan Sweeney and I both played on the lacrosse team during our times at Gordon. Go Scots. Uh, currently, as Amy said, so I graduated in 2018 and I work at Raytheon as a global trade licensing analyst. And what that means is that we handle a lot of the internal legal operations for Raytheon as it pertains to the export and import laws of the United States, whether that falls under the Department of Commerce's regulations or the Department of State's regulations. We deal a lot with military technology and we deal a lot with uh, commercial aviation technology, both of which is highly coveted by uh, Raytheon's competitors in the industry, as well as firms and countries overseas. So one of the things that we really do is that we work with uh, partnering countries and firms around the world, as well as the US government to ensure the safety of the hardware and the uh, technical data that we are entrusted with. So that when it goes to the front lines for our war fighters, or when it goes on a plane for our commercial aviation flyers, uh, we know that everyone's in good hands and that our research and development hasn't gone by the wayside because it's been taken by a bad actor. Uh, it was actually an interesting path for me getting there. I actually started in a number of roles. I started on the floor actually with the Environmental Health and Safety Office at Raytheon, just kind of a way to get your foot in the door, as they always say. It was very interesting. Got to see quite literally the behind the scenes uh, action at Raytheon, getting to see all the facilities, all the things that happen on the factory floor, getting to see the internal processes there. Moved on to the finance office, thought it would be a little bit more suited towards my background. And certainly it was, but it just wasn't something that I really was finding myself enjoying, uh, finding myself that I was best, uh, best at use for the company and something that wasn't really uh, connecting well with my skill set. So luckily this job turned up, I applied for it and got it. It's been about actually almost a year to date since I've moved into this role and I've absolutely loved it ever since. That's excellent. A great, great little story. And thank you for sharing that. I'm sure that's really helpful for many to hear. Um, so I'd love to go back a couple of years. Um, I think for Marcus and Brendan, it'll just be, we're, we're reversing a, a few years and maybe for Lindsay and Chris, a, a few more <laughs> than that. Um, love to, to go back to your college years. Um, what do you think you did to help you get where you are today? Is there one thing that you feel like you were doing in that four-year experience that you're sort of like, okay, that really helped me 
either get on the path to lead me to where I am, or at least get on the path. <laughs> um, Lindsay, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with that. Sure, um, that's a really good question. Um, I was actually thinking about this, like if there was that one thing that I did or didn't do. And I think what actually helped me get on my path was doing and trying everything I had interest in. I think through Gordon, like I started off as a political science um, focus and didn't graduate that way, but um, I got involved in like campaigns and then and thought I was going that route. I also thought I was gonna be a journalist at some point and tried that. And I just tried a bunch of different things until I kind of found my niche by um, happenstance um, getting, I got an internship with the FBI and didn't really plan on that. Um, and that just like kind of put me on the trajectory that I ended up in. And I'm so grateful for that. And I think like the biggest thing I did was just following what I had an interest in and just trying everything. Cause you are so like, that's the best time in your life to do that and make those mistakes and figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, because you'll get on your path. It's just, if you wanna, you know, try journalism or teaching or um, any of that, now is the time to really do that and see if it works. I think that will, that's probably the best thing I did. I love that. Thanks, Lindsay. So Lindsay, you'll probably laugh at this question, but how do you find an internship in the FBI? It, um, <laughs> was oh that gosh, something, yeah. was that something that someone at Gordon helped you with? Were you sort of still focused to say, I'm really interested in the FBI. I want to go and see what they actually have to offer. Um, I think like, it was actually one of my um, advisors at Gordon, um, Steve Alter had recommended that maybe I look at government institutions for an internship. And so I just started applying and I came across on the FBI's website, they have um, like a list of internships. And I didn't know this at the time, but I found this out through like constantly emailing the FBI, which I don't recommend doing. Um, <laughs> that their local offices will also offer internships outside of what's advertised. So it also works to like contact them and like the Boston office I know specifically is always looking for interns. And um, like, it's not the most glamorous thing, but it's, um, it gets you in the door and gets you that experience. And so if you're interested in going that route, don't hesitate to like, kind of be a little aggressive and apply and contact people and um, try to network. Um, you can reach out to me if you want to go that route. And like, that doesn't hurt to um, just keep on trying. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. Um, Brendan, I'm wondering, will, will you answer the question of just like, what do you feel like happened or one thing that, that occurred during your four years that kind of helped you get onto this path? Uh, yeah. So I think this also then kind of ties back to the question about um, what did I do during college that made me most career ready. But uh, the one thing surprisingly that ended up kind of spawning a few different doors that led to other opportunities was um, I was a political science major and one of our professors, Dr. Sherritt, who I believe is still still at the school, he was my favorite <laughs> professor. So be sure to give him a hello if you're listening to this <laughs> we'll do. classes. Um, he sent around an email from an alumni who worked in government for um, what is essentially a think tank um, that they had an event and they were looking for volunteers to check people into the event. Uh, it was something pretty simple. I think they were paying, you know, nothing really extraordinary, but that one opportunity I volunteered for, uh, was just sitting there writing name tags, checking people in, but that gave me the chance to interact with the director and some of the attendees. And he had a long career. Um, he started in DC, he's working on the state level now and started talking to me about different career opportunities. I was telling him some of my interests and through a conversation that then turned into a series of conversations, he actually connected me with um, my local state senator uh, and I, had an internship the summer of my junior year in that senator's office. Um, that experience then, you know, when I wanted to transition from local government, which was my first job to state government, ultimately opened the door for me to get the position that I had formally in the budget office. 
So I think that's kind of a weird rabbit hole, but I would definitely encourage you all, even something as simple as like parking cars for an event or writing name tags or something with an organization or in a field that you're interested in is a great opportunity to jump on because even just small interactions at a door when you're checking coats are a chance to network. And it's through those networking conversations that you're really able to start making connections that ultimately lead to these internships. Uh, so I would definitely, you know, that was my chance encounter that has gone a long way since then. And I would encourage everybody if there's a similar chance to jump at it and you never know where things will lead. Yeah, no, that's great. I see Lindsay like nodding her head up and down, like, yes, do that. <laughs> Um, um, Marcus, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing something similar, though I know your, your story was really helpful too, but wondering if there's another instance um, during your four years that you thought was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd say just a variety of things that I did on campus helped prepare me well for the variety of uh, you know, roles that I've taken on since college, whether that was being on a lacrosse team or participating in the men's ministry at Gordon. Uh, you know, there's a variety of activities, organizations, clubs that you can do on and off campus. Uh, so really kind of uh, those activities and roles helped me balance out who I became. It helped me deal with a variety of different environmental stressors, uh, whether they can be applied to work or whether it's uh, volunteering at church or even just your social uh, life and, you know, trying to sort some uh, personal issues out in your own head. Sometimes you get a little bit inundated. I'm sure during this uh, coronavirus situation, everyone's felt that way. Uh, just having all those experiences really helped me understand, okay, we know how to get through these things. We know how to persevere and overcome uh, a variety of different ways. It doesn't always have to be pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Sometimes it's just uh, diffusing the own uh, you know, falsehoods that you're telling yourself inside your head. So that's been one uh, very crucial thing in my opinion. Another, uh, like everyone else has said, it's really just about reaching out. Uh, you'd be surprised at the number of people who actually wanna help you. It's not that uh, scary of a world. You have four people who are here to help you right now, share their stories. People are always looking for help and they're always looking to help others. And that's something that I've found uh, very relevant when I was at Gordon and even more relevant today. Um, that's a great word, Marcus. And I know on my last alumni talk, we got to have um, Alexander Lowry join us for the call. And that's exactly the point that he made was there are four people right here already willing and ready to, to help you. So um, we certainly encourage students to connect with the folks that are here, whether that's um, over email, that's um, utilizing LinkedIn profiles and connecting with them over LinkedIn and, and reaching out and introducing themselves. So um, thanks for that, Marcus. Chris, love to hear from you in terms of, you know, those, those four years at Gordon. And I'm also very open to you um, sharing about kind of the parent perspective. I know you have a daughter who's, who's at Gordon as well. Um, so love to hear kind of what your experience was and maybe what your advice would be <laughs> um, to uh, someone who is a current student at Gordon. Sure. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm glad you picked me last on this one because it gave me some time to think about it. Because <laughs> why, um, I think, as I mentioned in the last uh, one of these deals that I did, you know, my, uh, my undergraduate degree was really preparation for my first career only to the extent that you need a degree to get commissioned in the Air Force. Um, and beyond that, it, it literally had no bearing. <laughs> I got a business degree. Um, I, I loved that. I enjoyed it a lot. If I had had the time to pick up a minor, uh, it would have been in political science. And, and I love studying that same, you know, I'm a history buff. I'm a politics, you know, policy weenie. Um, but because my ROTC course, coursework and the time that it took to participate in ROTC, uh, it, it just kind of sucked up a lot of my, my extra free time. Um, so, you know, I, I graduated with a, with a business degree and didn't really do a whole lot beyond just kind of the basic getting my degree stuff. Um, I didn't do internships or, or try to build a network for a first job thing because, you know, to the extent that I had to worry about my first job. It was just a question of where was the Air Force going to send me and was I going to get the job, the career field that I wanted to get. Um, so, 
the thing that I did at Gordon to help facilitate that, frankly, was I just was a good student. I mean, that, that's really what it came down to. I was focused on my studies. Uh, I would never say that I was, you know, a complete hermit or anything. I certainly had plenty of friends and the experience that I had at Gordon was, uh, was formative in my life. Uh, developed spiritually a ton. Uh, I have friends, you know, the friends that I went on La Vida with are friends to this day. Uh, and, and, you know, that will continue to persist. Uh, so it, it was amazing, but uh, it really was more just kind of a general growth as a person and things like just, you know, developing a good work ethic and developing good studying habits and, and developing the resiliency to deal with challenges and face failures. I mean, not everything went, it's, you know, perfectly, not everything went exactly the way I wanted, but, um, you know, when, when things were wrapping up and, you know, when the Air Force was looking at me and I was doing the paperwork in my senior year where I was asking the Air Force, you know, hey, this is what I would really like to go do in the Air Force. Um, the number one thing that they were looking at, honestly, was my GPA. Um, that was like the number one thing that that dealt with, you know, that, that led to my rank ordering in my class. Um, and that's what, you know, in the military, that's kind of like everything is a meritocracy and it's all based on objective factors. So, you know, if you're a good, you know, in, in that context, if you're a good student, you end up in the top of your class and you get, you know, first pick of the jobs as they come down. So I had the good fortune of being able to, you know, get the, the career field that I wanted to go into. Um, and that set me up on, you know, for success and doing the really interesting things that I did. So I would say to a current, current student, um, something that we say a lot in the military, which is do the best job you can in the job that you're in. If you're looking to go on and do something um, new and big and in particular, you know, in particular, you, you get people to help you out and, and advocate for you by doing well in the job that you're in. And when you're a student, your job is to be a student and do well in your coursework. Um, again, that that may in other contexts involve doing other things. And I absolutely would wholeheartedly agree with everything that Brendan said about the, you know, I was thinking I didn't do it at Gordon, but I did similar things in law school, honestly, which was interesting as a, you know, late forties guy surrounded by 20 somethings. But yeah, you know, I, I worked as a volunteer at a federalist society convention and met, you know, circuit court of appeals judges and Supreme court justices and, you know, doing the exact same thing, signing people in and filling out name tags like, Hey, Oh, judge Pryor, you know, you know, I, I met a, you know, judge uh, William Pryor from the 11th circuit on one of my first days there. And he, you know, ends up being one of the guys that was on the short list for, for uh, justice Kavanaugh's seat. Um, and, and I've got to meet judge Barrett, you know, last year doing the similar kinds of things. So, uh, that stuff is absolutely valid. I just, I just didn't happen to do it when I was at Gordon because I was doing stuff that was more military related. So yeah, you know, do the best job that you can in the job you're in. Be a good student. Uh, you know, take your classes seriously. Adapt. Develop resiliency in in dealing with things like this. Um, my my daughter has been telling me some very interesting stories uh, about trying to do Zoom teaching with like third graders. Um, you know, because she's doing her first round of student teaching this year as a junior ed major. And uh, yeah, it's been pretty interesting for her to have to deal with that. And I, you know, I chuckle with her and then I say, hey, you know what, sweetie, you're going to be a digital native, uh, you know, doing distance learning right out of the shoot if you need to. Uh, at least you're not a, a teacher who's set in her ways for 25 years trying to adapt to figure out how to do this. So um, that, that doesn't go very far, but, you know, it, it helps a little bit. It sounds good coming from me. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, what else? Was there something else? I think that pretty much hit No, me. that's perfect. That's really great. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, I love the, you know, the primary job, the primary job being school. It sounds like what I'm telling my 15 year old son on a regular basis, you know, football actually is not your primary job. You know, school is your primary job, just so you know. <laughs> um, so it's great to hear other people say that as well. Um, and such a good reminder for, for college students as well, because there's so much to take advantage of, which is good, but it's good to be strategic about how you're utilizing your time so that you're, you're balancing what the priorities do need to be. I appreciate that. Um, so this is a little bit of a funny question. Um, and you all can, especially um, Lindsay and Chris, you all can can choose, you know, what job you want to talk about with this particular question. Um, but would love to hear what does day to day work life look like for you all. Um, so I think I'd love to hear. Maybe Brendan, would you mind kicking us off with this with this particular question? What does a day in the work life of Brendan Sweeney look like? Yeah. Um, so. As I mentioned earlier, my position is focused entirely on the pandemic. 
Um, my subset is the federal funds office of the larger office of administration and finance and that federal funds office itself didn't exist. So we have five or six of us on staff and a couple of consultants we're working with and none of us knew we would be doing this job at the start of the pandemic, let alone even a few months ago. Uh, so things change day to day. The one thing that's very consistent in my role is that as the person managing our coronavirus relief efforts with the municipalities, I'm constantly talking to uh, finance directors, town managers and mayors uh, to both listen to their problems, try to figure out where we can help them. But then also for many of them, they have specific requests of how they best believe they could utilize the funding. And I then take that public interfacing aspect and apply it to so that's kind of the local interaction aspect. And then the other aspect um, is on the federal side. We get a lot of guidance from the federal government. So one consistent thing that I'm doing is working through the materials that the federal government gives us to determine how we can actually utilize the funding that they've given us. I'm sure many of you are aware the CARES Act was the relief efforts that the federal government put out in March. Um, I'm pretty consistently working through those guidelines and with our legal team, and some folks in the treasury office at the federal level to try to figure out what we can do to structure the program to both stay within the confines of the federal guidelines, but then back to the local side, meet the needs that I'm hearing from these mayors and town managers and finance directors. Um, so no, those are kind of the consistent functions of the job, but within that, no two days are the same. Um, and I find it very rewarding. I, you know, the pandemic is just all consuming at this point. So the fact that I can find a way to directly help a lot of these cities and towns that are in a tough spot is a rewarding job for me. Uh, but just given the nature of the pandemic, things change every day. Uh, so, so no two days are the same, but that's generally kind of the structure that I've been working with the last few months or so. No, it sounds like you won't get bored. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, Lindsay, what about for you? Um, mine's actually sort of similar to Brendan's where um, my day-to-day -day activity definitely changes um, depending on what the issue is for that day. Um, at WeWork, what that looks like is um, I kind of have the days actually split. So in the morning, it's more focused on um, meeting with my group of analysts, identifying what like threats might have come in or what issues are happening like close to our locations. Um, and trying to get an idea of what they are. And then um, in my role, I then like brief um, my management, like the executive um, management and like the C-suite, so like CEO, CFO and such. And then the afternoons are more consisted of um, like working with my team to right now develop ways that we can um, like keep our employees safe and members safe and figure out like what, um, if any criminal enterprises are operating in our spaces. So we do a lot of um, like research, meeting with outside groups, um, working closely with um, my counterpart and their teams in other private sector groups, such as like Disney, Microsoft, Apple. Um, we actually, our corporate security um, uh, infrastructures are very close. And so I meet with their managers of Intel. Um, in the government, it was, oddly very similar, although those days, depending on like, um, like for me, I was on the operations side. So depending on where you are in the world, um, then it could look a little different, but you're always trying to like identify what um, could harm uh, like the government, the people, the mission, and um, how to actually quickly identify that, mitigate that and make sure the right information is given um, to the decision maker so they can enforce that. Um, so a lot of each day kind of look different depending on what pops up, um, but like we, we make it work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Chris, what about for you? What does day-to-day -day look like for you? Yeah, so, you know, day-to-day -day for me in the military was totally a function of where I was and what point I was in, the, in my career. It, it varied from, uh, you know, if I was flying, it was, you know, showing up super early in the morning and going flying an eight, 10, 12 hour mission and, and landing and debriefing it all. Um, you know, that was a, a full day event. Um, 
if I wasn't flying, then it was doing something else around the squadron, some kind of, you know, additional duty job. And as I progressed through in the military, you know, when you, you go from being just kind of responsible for yourself and your own proficiency to broader responsibilities and leading people and teaching and things like that. And it just, so it just varied, you know, by the time it, at the end of my career, I was on the faculty at the college. And so I was, you know, teaching a couple times a week and, and doing curriculum development in and around that. Um, as a lawyer now, it, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the things that I like about the law is that it's a mix of, it's almost like being a student again. You know, it, it, it's everything from interacting with clients and figuring out what the, what the issue is that they need solved or, you know, what the problem is that they're trying to solve uh, and developing the facts and understanding what the facts are of their situation uh, to researching the law and figuring out how the law applies to those facts, coming up with a strategy, figuring out the best way to argue, to advocate, um, you know, what case law am I going to use to convince this judge uh, that we're going to go in front of that my client's position is the strongest and that he should rule in our favor. Uh, and honestly, it's it's a lot of writing because a lot of what I do is resolved on the briefs. You know, a lot of what we do is resolved by what the briefing that we present to the judge before we even show up. Um, that's kind of the best case. Uh, it's best for the client because it saves time and money later on. Um, and uh, honestly, it's... Um, yeah, so I, that's a lot of what a lot of the work that I do is especially the appellate work. That's all briefing. That's all research and writing, researching and writing and researching and writing and then submitting the briefs to the justices. Um, and even at the at the the trial litigation level, um, I I avoid standing up in front of a jury at all costs. That is just not my thing. Some guys are trial lawyers that love to do that stuff. I don't. Um, I, I avoid it like the plague if I possibly can try to resolve things um, either, you know, by settling before it goes to trial or not getting involved in the trial level work and only dealing with appeals and, and just, you know, motions practice before the trial. We have other partners in the firm that kind of thrive on that. And so we try to focus on our strengths and in the areas where we need to, uh, where we do the best. I'm still, I still do stuff, you know, I, I still certainly appear in court. Uh, I'm going to court in a couple of weeks on a, you know, on a low level trial thing. Uh, but and so then it's preparation for that, you know, it's getting everything organized, it's getting all the law lined up, um, putting notes together, you know, making, making binders to take with you to court and so that you're ready to then speak. And so, you know, you're doing written communication and oral communication and, and trying to anticipate what the other side's doing. Um, so uh, again, similar to everybody, I guess, you know, nobody seems to do the same thing every day. And I kind of like that. That was important to me. Um, that was something that was that was really important to me when I was retiring. Uh, when I retired from the military, I I was really looking for a job where it wouldn't be the same thing every day. And that was something that I really liked about the military. Um, uh, it's you know the downside of that, of course, is that sometimes that variety is you get called to go someplace far away on a moment's notice for a long time, and that's not necessarily fun. Um, but I liked the fact that. You know, I, I wasn't stuck doing the same thing every day, day in, day out for a long time. And even after a year or two, uh, you know, if you were really wrung out, you, you could find something else to do, even if it didn't involve moving. Uh, my, my first year on the staff at UCOM was very much the same thing over and over again. And after about a year of it, I was looking at some of my buddies going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to have to keep doing this for the next two years. Uh, and that was one one of them suggested that I throw my hat in the ring to work for the general on his staff. Um, and that was a, that was a big switch and, and a good one. Cause then that got me back into the doing different stuff at different times and traveling and meeting with people and, um, getting involved in higher level policy stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. The day in that's the life. great. Thank you, Marcus. What about for you? What does a uh, day to day look like for you? A hundred meetings and a thousand emails. <laughs> um, no, but in a more serious manner, uh, it, looks a little bit different each day, uh, especially depending upon what the uh, consensus was from the night before. So typically before I go to bed each evening, I'll see a flush of emails come across my phone screen. I'll check them quickly and then I can know what I need to start off with the next day. If it's a little bit quieter, sometimes I start off with the uh, more long-term projects. If we have a submission that's going to the Department of State or to uh, perhaps like the ATF or some other three-letter government agency, I can start on that. I can get some emails done, some correspondences, whether that's to our uh, own people internally, Raytheon employees, whether that's to uh, another partner over at a firm like Lockheed per se, or if that's even to someone over in Germany. So, uh, for example, this morning, uh, you know, 
Monday morning, 8 a.m., a little bit more quiet, was able to get some work done, uh, able to go through a couple documents, make some comments, turn over some revisions. This morning, 8 a.m., I'm on a phone call with uh, both personnel from the U.S. and Germany. We're just having a status tag up. Uh, each morning looks a little bit different. Each afternoon looks a little bit different, and each evening looks different. Um, but typically, in each given day, and especially each given week, I can expect to meet with the internal stakeholders that we have, so the program management office or the legal ops team. Uh, either there will be a question about a uh, plan that they have going forward, uh, a new order that they've got, or a new um, contract that they've received, or there's an issue internally that we're looking to resolve, perhaps something with our own uh, intelligence system, our own database has gone awry and that we need to uh, correct it. Other times it's just interpretation of a new rule or a new uh, government ruling. Each, uh, each day they publish something called a federal register. It's a list of everything that's happening in the federal government that day. And some days you see things that are going to directly impact the business and directly impact the programs that you're working on. Perhaps there's an embargo or perhaps there's a new tariff and you need to reroute items or you need to work with the program office or supply chain to find new suppliers or a new way of doing things. So a lot of it is thinking on your feet, uh, excuse me, thinking on your feet and critical thinking. Uh, as with every single job, it always helps to be cordial. A lot of tensions run high. So the, the calmer that you can keep things, uh, the better for your own sanity and, and certainly the uh, faster things get resolved. Sounds great. I see some nodding heads on those last remarks in particular with everybody in the group. Just the keeping cordial, being professional, uh, because there's often tensions. Um, wondering if anybody else wants to kind of speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I'll, I'll jump in if you don't mind. Um, the first thing that was popping into my mind as he was saying that was uh, some guidance that a, a senior officer gave me when I started out on the staff at European Command. Um, so, you know, mid part of my career and he, he looked me in the eye and he said, Chris, your success or failure uh, on this staff in the next three years is going to depend 100% on your ability to form and develop and 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 uh, not exploit, but uh, your your ability to successfully work with the other people, right? To 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 develop relationships with the other action officers on the staff, uh, you know, build those relationships and work with them uh, and and interact with them in the hopes of you know with the intent of accomplishing whatever it is that the that the general needs us to accomplish. So. Uh, you know, he, that's, it's just huge. It's a key to pretty much everything. Um, and, and that's also kind of the first step in developing leadership, um, which is another thing that I would say, you know, it's important for people to think about the earlier you start thinking about that uh, and developing your ability as a leader. Um, the, the, I think the, the farther you will go, the better you will do uh, in whatever field you're in. Uh, I am convinced beyond uh beyond anything that there's really no area where leadership is not important. Um, and I absolutely distinguish between leadership and management. I think we manage people, uh, manage resources, we lead people. Um, you, you get the most out of an organization by leading it well and leading the people well. Uh, if you treat people like resources, that is not gonna go well. Um, and if you, if you focus only on resources to the detriment of, of taking care of the people that work for you, uh, that will also not go well. And, and you're never, it's never too early to start learning about that, start paying attention to that. Um, you know, obviously in the military, it's a big part of life as an officer. Um, but even, you know, as an aviator, even I, I didn't do a lot of leading the first three or four years that I was on active duty. It wasn't until I had been around for a few years, uh, just because of the function of the job that I was in. We just didn't, you know, didn't have to, um, as opposed to other career fields where, you know, new officers are, are leading large numbers of people right from the very beginning. Um, but that obviously became a big deal later on in my career. Uh, and it's kind of the cornerstone of, of success in the mil as an officer in the military or even as an NCO, um, just leading in different kinds of ways. So uh, yeah, develop the ability to work with people, uh, develop the, you know, work on that ability, ability to develop relationships and get along and be cordial and civil. Um, and there's, there's literally no place where that is not important. It will, it will serve you well anywhere and everywhere.
Yeah, thank you, Chris. I, I will say, um, if there are students that would like to pose questions um, to an individual that's that's on our panel or to the group collectively, um, we would certainly be be happy to take any questions that that folks have. Um, Lindsay, I saw you nodding your head, um, both in terms of the the um, cordial remark that Marcus said, but also when Chris was mentioning um, management um, and versus leading. Um, wondering if you want to speak to either of those topics. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, first, like on the cordial part, it is very like important to always be kind and compassionate when um, like I have found that has that goes a long way in having like tense conversations with folks about like hard topics. And it also goes a long way like cross culturally. So if you're ever in a position where um, like you're business or you're in the government or whatnot where you're working across like cultural lines that really goes a long way and so I just was nodding my head like it's really important um and then as um when Chris mentioned you know you manage resources and you lead people um I think like that's really critical and that's how I I tried to like lead my team um and I've been like very blessed to be in a lot of leadership roles in the government and outside the government. And the stronger leaders are those that really take care of their people and they work to develop their people and are constantly looking for the best of for their people. Um, so I think that's just a really important reminder and to keep in the back of your head because even if you go out to the workforce and like an entry level job, that leadership skill is what's going to get you to the next level and it's what's really going to help you be a, a good um, contributor as well. That's great. Um, Lindsay, we did just receive one question that is actually specifically for you. So I'm wondering if I can post that for you. Um, so Ryan just asked, um, what's one piece of advice um, you would give to someone interested in joining the intelligence field? What is the best way to learn more about that field as well? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would recommend, um, like, oh, that's a really good question. If you're looking to join the intelligence field, I know there is a private sector component and then a, like the public sector in the government. And um, coming right out of Gordon, I say apply to both sides. Um, first off, the government's going to take years to get you in um, with the background, but just apply and try it out. It is, a, I love the field, obviously. It's, um, it's just a good area and it's um, a really good field to really grow into and you get exposed to a lot of different things. And so um, that's definitely one thing I would recommend and talking with people that um, are open, um, that can actually talk to you about what you might be interested in because the intelligence field, even in the government is, there's an, an intelligence component um, to a variety of agencies. There's, I think, 17 considered to be in the intel intelligence community, and they all do very different things. So it depends on what you really want to focus on. Um, like the CIA does do some cool stuff, but so does Treasury. They do some really awesome stuff, and you would never think about them. And FBI does, and the Department of Defense, and NSA. Um, I will say, if you're really good at math, go to the NSA. They will need you. But um, like definitely explore and don't get discouraged um, and don't uh, like focus your studies necessarily on that either. That's a big thing. Um, focus on what you're passionate about if you're in like your first two years at Gordon um, because that type of community in that field really looks for um, people who can think well and write well and everything else you can be taught. And so having that expertise in an area, um, whether it be theater, whether it be uh, Asian studies or um, European studies or uh, math or anything is gonna be really valuable. Um, did I answer both those questions? I think so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. No um, so the next, next question I have for you all, I'm always not sure how I wanna phrase this question. So I, I will say I like change it a little bit every week. Um, I would love to hear just about your walk with the Lord as it relates to 
to job and profession. So a lot of times we use the word calling, um, which I think has a lot of, of weight. Um, it feels very heavy to say, oh, I've been called and this is what I've been called to do right now. So I'd just love to hear about just kind of that intersection of your faith with the work that you are doing. Um, Brendan, would you mind kicking us off with this one? Sure. Um, so I think there's a handful of things I could say on this. Um, probably the one that really stands out to me that I would encourage you all to keep in mind as you begin on your own career paths is there is definitely something to be said about how you carry yourself as a Christian. And I think that as far as how your relationship with God factors into your day-to-day -day work, that is probably the biggest one for me. And I think, you know, situationally in the position that I'm in now, um, dealing with the pandemic, uh, there's a lot to be negative about. There's a lot of challenges. And I think as a Christian, these are things that we know to be a part of our faith is adversity. And we know that God will challenge us. And so that's something that I try to keep in mind um, as I interact with folks. Um, it's a lot of folks on the municipal level, but then also other guys in state government and on the federal level on a day-to-day -day basis. I always try to keep the positive approach um, and that understanding that, you know, as you walk with God, he is with you and you can do all things through him. Um, I'm hopeful that that's had an effect on the folks I've worked with. I can't say for certain, but I do think that's probably the main way that I'm trying to be intentional about bringing my faith to my work is that, you know, especially now when times are tough, uh, to live, live by example on that end and to, you know, rather than get down or be negative to try to stay positive because ultimately that's how we're called to live through faith. That's great. Thank you. Marcus, what about for you? Yeah, I really couldn't agree more with what uh, Brennan said. I just, uh, even from my internships and in my two full-time roles at Raytheon, I've really noticed a difference in the uh, way that you uh, bring your faith into the workplace has an effect on both the quality of work that you're doing and on the attitudes and performances of people around you. Uh, you know, you deal with a diverse cast of characters at Raytheon, people of all the different mindsets. You have engineers, you have legal experts, you have ex-military folks, you have uh, financiers all coming together, all different ways of thinking about things, and they all come from diverse backgrounds. As I said, uh, you know, we have a lot of international partners, so really respecting all, uh, like, the diversity of life that God has really created, both in ways people think and just the way every, uh, like, the amount of cultures and the, uh, like, just just the whole amalgamation of it really um i've also really grown to appreciate just the actual notion of vocation itself so one of the unique things that we actually have at raytheon is something called the 980 schedule it works well at the production floor you work extra hours one week so it means that every other friday you have off really nice in some ways but some fridays it gets really really boring almost because you find yourself doing nothing you find yourself stagnant you find yourself almost yearning for, for work, something to apply yourself to. And I've really come to appreciate just the role that work has in our lives and the way that God has called us to specific work in that matter. Love that, that's a, that's a great word there, Marcus, thank you. Um, Lindsay and Chris, I'm gonna throw you a curveball now. So just when you were thinking about your response probably to that last question, <laughs> we've got a, a new one that's been submitted, but, but just a slight variation. So. We've got one of our students has also asked um, that several of, of you all have discussed the importance of building resiliency. How has your faith helped you learn how to do this? So a slightly different variation. I'll say it one more time, just in case. Several of you have discussed the importance of building resiliency. How has your faith helped you learn how to do this? Um, so I'm wondering, Chris, do you feel feel ready to, to answer that one? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I can I can jump in on that, and and I'll I'll say that's for a combination of reasons. Number one is that um, the, the the biggest one being that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that and and teaching my own kids that right. So um, yeah, I, I have given this a little bit of thought lately, but um, 
the the first thing that popped into my mind when you said that was uh, something that a a retired three star told me when I was a you know back in the late '90s when I was a captain. Um, General Bruce Fister, who had retired from the Air Force uh, a, a while before that and was the executive director of Officers Christian Fellowship, uh, led a retreat for us down in Florida. And, and he talked about the importance of having an eternal perspective on life. Um, and that was kind of the first thing that someone taught me that really addressed that issue of resiliency. It, and it's, um, I, I hate to sound morbid, um, but it, it's it really at its core, it's the idea that as believers, we know that no matter how bad it gets here on earth, it will get better. Um, and, and I think that is a unique perspective on life that people who aren't believers just don't have. Uh, and that's unfortunate. And it's something that, you know, that I think we're called to share with the world. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, it, it's not a reason to be uh, fatalistic, or I think, or to say, I don't care or to uh, do nothing. Uh, I think that's part of what, that what that's what distinguishes Christ, the Christian perspective on this from what I saw in the Middle East and the, the, the Islamic perspective on this of inshallah, you know, um, it was, you know, that was what led people in Saudi Arabia to leave car accident victims laying by the side of the road and not bother to call an ambulance because, oh, inshallah, if Allah wants him to live, he'll live. Um, that was my experience. That was what I observed. Um, that struck me as, you know, not maybe the best way to approach life, but I felt like our faith as, as believers allowed us to simultaneously um, understand what the word says about, you know, not worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worry of its own, kind of concentrate on today, know that, the, you know, God will look out for us and will take care of us. And it doesn't mean that everything will be perfect, but that he'll be there with us through the challenges. Um, but at the same time, you know, value life and value God's creation and, and your fellow man and do what you can to help them and, and do things to um, bring God's common grace to the whole community and the whole world. So um, that, you know, I guess when it comes to developing resiliency, it's um, it's developing through kind of a mental discipline, that idea of being able to look at the challenges that you face, whether it's um, something as relatively minor as maybe a career setback, which I'm sure we've all had, you know, I've, I've had, well, except maybe you guys that haven't been in careers long enough to have had to worry about that yet. Maybe that's a blessing that you have. Uh, you have it to look forward to at some point. I can guarantee you everyone will suffer a career setback at some point. Uh, <laughs> and you can, you know, being able to look at that and say, you know what, okay, this is not the end of my world. Um, something else will come out of the other side of this. Uh, maybe it's a lesson that I need to learn. Uh, you know, in order to, to do something better next time, maybe it's just God, you know, moving through the system to help keep me away from something that I shouldn't have been around. And, you know, maybe it's just a consequence of something that I did wrong, uh, that I've just got to deal with, but, you know, God's going to be there with me through it. Um, so that's, that's maybe an individual thing that might seem very minor in the grand scope of life, but you can develop resiliency for through something like that. Uh, and then when, you know, much bigger, major problems happen, um, you've got to, you know, you, you can be more prepared for it. I've been teaching my kids lately that, you know, because I'll say, hey, you got to develop resiliency to deal with this challenge. And they're like, oh, yeah, dad, thanks. It sounds so easy. I'll just snap my fingers and everything will be fine. And the point I make to them is, no, you, you don't develop resiliency for dealing with big things by just snapping your fingers. Um, you develop like mental resiliency for dealing with big things the same way you develop physical ability to do big things. If you want to do 50 pushups, you don't just start and do 50 pushups. You do one push up for a couple of day, a day for a couple of days and then you do five push ups a day for a couple of days and then you do 10 push ups a day for a couple of weeks and eventually you can do 50 push ups um, but you got to start you got to start dealing with the hard thing whatever it might be a little bit at a time um, and when you can deal with little things when you can do it, deal with hard things you know small hard things over and over again eventually you develop the ability to deal with big hard things so you know we talk about resiliency in in small things and then when you know, when 9-11 hits and I'm, I'm putting a crew together and we're building mobility bags and loading up at the, you know, in the squadron and we don't know if we're leaving tomorrow or if we're leaving next month and when we, we don't know where we're going, you know, but we know we're going to do something. And, you know, when we get over there, it, it's, I mean, it was, it got real, you know, and, and we weren't even in positions where we were like under real serious threat all the time, right? Like this is, it's not like I was in the special forces and was running around the ground getting shot at and things were blowing up around me. But, um, you know, we didn't know if they were going to, you know, try to slime us, you know, we were carrying gas masks around where we were living. And, and I had people that came up to me and said, Hey, you know, 
Captain Hollinger, Major Hollinger, I, I don't know. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm scared. You know, we don't know if there's not a guy with a man pad out there at the end of the runway getting ready to try to take out, you know, one of the few big C2 airplanes that would be a big splash. Um, you know, none of us wanted to have something like that happen. So then we were dealing with big, heavy issues. Um, and, you know, I was able to provide a, a perspective on that that a lot of other people maybe didn't. Um, and, you know, shared my faith a little bit with a couple of people here and there and just gave them some, you know, some eternal perspective to deal with hard things like that. So, sorry, rambling a little bit there. I apologize. I'll stop. No, no, Chris. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, thank you for the good the good words that you have and the experiences that you've had to be able to share and, and pass along. This is exactly what we're looking for. I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm wondering if I can ask Lindsay um, in our last, you know, minute here <laughs> to, to share her thoughts too on that same resiliency question. Sure. Um, I know Chris answered it really well. So I'll just add um, like one thing I did, because I know it's so easy. I look back like it's been like 11, 12 years since I was at Gordon. And when I remember looking out onto like the future, you don't really anticipate it being that difficult. Um, but like over the past like decade or so, there's been a lot of challenges where I know God has like tested my faith. And you do hit those points where you wonder if you really are resilient or if you can be. And I think like when the key questions or key words in the question was like to learn. And I find I'm consistently and constantly learning how to really like lean on my faith more and trusting God like wholly. Um, I know like for me uh, going through, cause there were like hard times, like in the government, there are certain things you go through where you really question like everything about yourself. And I always kind of kept a little slip of paper in my pocket with um, Jeremiah 29, 11, where like, for I know the plans I have for you, just like constantly reiterating that until it would sink in. And it still hasn't fully sunk in. Hopefully it will someday. But just that reminder that God already knows what's coming. And so just like trusting that. And I think that that gives you a little bit of confidence and a little bit of resilience and knowing that like eternally things will be okay. And just having that trust as hard as it's going to be and it will get hard if it hasn't already so yeah thank you all so much this has been such a great conversation i wish we could keep doing this much longer um but i, I thank you each one of you so much lindsay brendan marcus chris for your time this evening we're so grateful um to have you all take the time out of your evening to spend it with us at Gordon <laughs> or wherever we may be. <laughs> um, and thank you students that were able to, to join in. We're so grateful for your time. We really hope um, that this was um, beneficial uh, to your learning and your path. Um, like I said earlier, feel free to reach out to these folks. Um, everyone here is on LinkedIn and you can, you can connect with them that way. Um, but feel free if you have other questions that, that I can answer or I could pass along to my colleagues in CCI. Um, you're always welcome to email me as well. Um, so I can help you make, make some of these connections. Again, my, my email address is amy.france at gordon.edu. So feel free to reach out. And I just wanted to say thank you one more time to everyone. So I hope everyone has a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody, see ya.